thank you for viewing this presentation. In the presentation, I will highlight the standard Doppler assessment in fetal echocardiography, as well as some case-based or targeted assessments in fetuses with hemodynamic compromise or congenital heart disease with abnormal hemodynamic physiology. The use of Doppler ultrasound in fetal echo is essential when cardiovascular abnormalities are suspected or present because hemodynamic physiology is usually abnormal in these cases and Doppler can help with the diagnosis. Pattern recognition of normal Doppler physiology helps the operator identify abnormal physiology. It's completely safe for the fetus after 10 weeks, although the operator should use Alara or settings that keep the ultrasound energy as low as reasonably achievable. And you want to minimize the pulse wave and color Doppler dwell time, that is time that you're actually scanning with these modalities on the fetus. And optimizing the thermal index in tissue and bone is best for fetal scanning. And you can see generally where we are with TTE scanning is a thermal index that is above 1.0 uh, and the range ranges all the way past 1.8. And with fetal echo scanning, you can see we typically do these scans less than an hour and the optimal thermal index should be below 1.0 and ideally right around point zero point seven. Now for the standard fetal echo cooler and spectral Doppler exam, we look at flows through all cardiac structures, including the pulmonary veins, one from either side, the atrioventricular valve inflows, the ventricular outflow tracts, and semilunar valve outflows. Also, we look at the pre and post cardiac flows and what this means is the umbilical venous and arterial uh, circulation, the intrahepatic umbilical vein, the section of the umbilical vein, and that's before the ductus venosus. We also look at the DV, the ductus venosus flow pattern, the IVC, the SVC, and the hepatic veins, as well as the aortic and ductal arches. And so after performing our initial fetal presentation in lie, we start in the four chamber view looking at the pulmonary veins as shown here, right pulmonary veins with color Doppler, left pulmonary vein. And we evaluate that with spectral Doppler in each one of the pulmonary veins. We try to align as parallel as possible with the plane of incination. And this is a normal pulmonary venous tracing. And so next we focus on the inflows. And so this is a four chamber view. The atria are here. You can see a right pulmonary vein coming in, and this is how we would line this up. Now, now to demonstrate a useful method of lining the inflows up with the plane of incination, in a case where you had the inflows more at a perpendicular lie, you would translate the transducer to a point where you can line the inflows up, and this gives you the most accurate information when you're performing color and spectral Doppler. As you can see here, after translating the transducer to a point where it tips the apex of the heart up, in this case, where you have the atria and the flow coming toward the transducer, this better aligns your inflows for a more accurate assessment of the mitral valve inflow and the tricuspid valve inflow. These are normal tracings. Again, you have a smaller E wave and a larger A wave. The E wave is roughly half the size of the A wave in both of these tracings. And of note, with a normal heart rate in the fetus, you typically should have biphasic or two waves, an E and an A, and they should not be fused together. The outflow tracts are next, and you can see here the LV outflow tract and the RV outflow tract are at opposite angles. In this case, the RV outflow tract at the end of this sweep is in almost in plane with the plane of incination. And so keep that in mind when you're placing color Doppler to evaluate these 
flows and you want to align these flows such that you have them in plane with the plane of insonation. Here are the RV alpha tract, pulmonary valve here are in plane and as you see here on the left panel this is the LV alpha tract. I've aligned it in plane with the plane of imaging uh, and the same with the pulmonary valve over here and this gives you nice normal appearing tracings. Next are the three vessel and three vessel tracheal views sweeping up from the outflow tracks. And here you can see aortic arch, ductal arch over here. Here's the trachea and the SVC. Importantly, you need to align these with the plane of insonation as well. When you put the color Doppler on, you should have anagrade flow through both of these ductal and aortic arches. These arches here should form a V to the left of the trachea, and they should again be the same color flow should go integrated through the ductus and integrated through the aortic arch. What about from the back of the fetus? In this case, we have the ductus here, the ductal arch and the aortic arch. This is the V of the ductal and aortic arch, the three vessel tracheal view. And you can see the flow is going toward the transducer so they're both going to be red and so this puts these arches in line with the plane of insonation but from the back of the fetus here's the spine but it's important also to rotate the probe so that you get a long axis view of these structures because sometimes we're not seeing flow acceleration or flow obstruction in that three vessel tracheal view sometimes it's further down the, the distal arches. And so this allows us to see the entire aortic arch and ductal arch all the way through to the proximal descending aorta and better align these flows and so you can interrogate them appropriately. And here is the ductal arch. You can see clearly that you can see the flow through here and all the way down to the proximal descending aorta. These are normal tracings. This is the aortic arch, and you can see the difference between the aortic arch and the ductal arch flow tracings here with diastolic continuation of flow, a normal feature in the ductus arteriosus. And the normal velocities are shown, typically right around one meter per second, but less than 1.5 meters per second. After evaluating the aortic and ductal arches, we move on to the evaluation of the systemic venous flows and here you have the umbilical vein coming into the portal sinus here with continuous integrated flow. The oval is representing where the ductus venosus is. In this case, this is an axial view, a transverse view through the fetal abdomen. And you can interrogate the ductus venosus from this angle as long as it's in plane with the plane of insonation, again, flowing parallel with the plane of insonation. It's not the best angle because you don't know how the fetus is laying in this position. Uh, we, we know it looks like it's mostly a transverse view through the fetal abdomen, but when you, when you rotate things to a sagittal view, it better aligns, it can allow you to better align things with the plane of imaging. So here you can see the umbilical vein nicely coming in. Here is the point at which the ductus venosus uh, starts, and you can see flow acceleration exactly where you would put the sample volume to sample that. And these are tracings from the ductus venosus here, a normal tracing with the SD and then the A here, and no return to baseline. This is key. And then the umbilical vein upstream of that, we would sample just above the ductus venosus to see if we have any pulsations. And this is a normal tracing. It should be flat all unidirectional above the baseline. And then comparing the ductus venosus tracing to the hepatic venous tracing that we do as well after the ductus venosus, we will evaluate the hepatic venous uh, flow pattern. And this is a normal SD and A wave appearance of the hepatic vein. And for comparison here on the left side is that normal tracing and here on the right panel, we see a fetus that has vein of Gala malformation, and you can clearly see the atrial reversals on this ductus venosus tracing. Here's SD and A. Again, this should be no reversal, 
uh, and the normal ductus venosus, and here you have a significant amount of reversal. This is indicative of a volume load on that on that right heart, and it translates back again to the hepatic venous tracing as well, where you have a normal SD and A over here. There should be some reversal, uh, A wave reversal on the normal hepatic venous tracing. In this case, you have a severe amount here. And so the forward to reverse ratio is significantly abnormal. Here you have 0.9, where normally you should have less than or equal to 0.2. The umbilical vessels should also be aligned with the plane of incination. As you can see here, this is the umbilical vein, umbilical artery, again, three vessel cord, two arteries and a vein. And you should have a unidirectional flow in either one of these tracings. Here is the umbilical vein. It's all above the baseline. There should be no pulsations on this tracing. It should be flat like this, all unidirectional. And again, the umbilical arterial tracing should have a systolic and a diastolic component, should never return to baseline, should never be reversed, and should always have at the end of diastole some degree of anti-grade flow, at least a quarter to a third of the height of the peak velocity. Now we do a case-based evaluation with Doppler, and so we'll do the same components of the Doppler evaluation that I've just shown. Uh, looking at all those different structures and looking at the flows through the through the different the parts of the anatomy, but we will tailor them to focus on certain parts of the anatomy based on the type of lesion that we see. And so, with obstructive lesions, we'll focus more attention on the valves. Uh, if there's interatrial restriction in cases like hypoplastic left or right heart ductus constriction uh, and coarctation, we will look and focus at those regions of interest uh, with our Doppler evaluation. The same thing with high output lesions. We'll do things like cardiac outputs and velocities through certain structures, relative stenoses through certain vascular structures. Cardiac dysfunction can also cause some do Doppler abnormalities that we'll evaluate, as well as arrhythmias and um, doing a rhythm assessment on these cases that have abnormal rhythms. So let's start off with our case-based evaluation, and we're going to start off with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Here you have enlarged right atrium, right ventricle. You're not seeing much of a left ventricle here. This is left. This is right. Here you see a small left atrium with some pulmonary veins draining here. The atrial septum is shown here faintly, and you see what looks like probably a small atrial communication here. The first thing we want to do is evaluate flow through the tricuspid valve, make sure that this flow pattern is normal, uh, no regurgitation through here. The next thing we're going to do is focus on the pulmonary veins, and this tells us a lot in these cases. So the main thing is that the pulmonary venous flow coming back from the lungs has to get across the atrial septum without restriction because there is no mitral valve flow. This is obstructed here. In this case, you have mitral atresia. In a case where you have a small little mitral valve and a small left ventricle where there's very high filling pressure because of the downstream obstruction, critical aortic valve stenosis, or atresia, you're going to need to get all of this flow coming back to the left atrium across the atrial septum left to right without restriction. And so when we look at the flow through this area of the atrial septum, we're not really seeing a lot in the way of a blue flow, which should be below the base, uh, downward on the screen because it's going away from the transducer. You're seeing some red swirling in here. This may just be flow from the ductus venosus. So it's hard to make that out. But the surrogate for evaluating the left atrial pressure or the, the level of restriction of flow through that atrial septum is to evaluate the pulmonary venous tracing. And so in this case, we're going to do this anyways. This is part of our evaluation. And what we're seeing here is a normal appearing tracing for this case of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. What we're looking for is any reversal of flow uh, of the atrial pulsations. And so in this case, we have very minimal atrial reversal, atrial A wave reversal in this hypoplastic left heart syndrome, which tells me that the atrial septal flow is unrestricted. The next thing a sonographer should do is focus their attention on flow through the arches. Here we have a long axis view of the ductal arch. 
in this case where you have the back of the fetus up here and so the flow should be going anagrade toward the transducer it is red here and it's it's a normal looking pattern and so there's a little bit of diastolic blue flow here in this region right there that represents right retrograde flow in the ascending aorta the ascending aorta is severely hypoplastic and the aortic valve is atretic and so we'll have retrograde flow through that part of the aorta and the aortic arch here you can see systolic retrograde flow in the transverse aortic arch hypoplastic looking aorta but you have anagrade perfusion perfusion to the head and neck vessels here and that's important because there's aortic atresia that ductus needs to perfuse the aortic arch retrograde to get that blood flow up to the brain and so when you pulse that you'll see these systolic retrograde pulsations in that transverse aortic uh, arch here from that long axis view we can rotate orthogonal to that view and this is a 90 degree orthogonal rotation to the three vessel tracheal view here you can see the ductal arch again this is near the back of the baby here's the spine and so we're aligning this with the plane of incination so we can evaluate with color and spectral doppler what the flow pattern is through the ductus arteriosus here and the aortic arch which is systolic retrograde flow through that aortic arch again there's the trachea and SVC up here and so you can see that there's systolic retrograde flow through that aortic arch and the anatomy of the aortic arch in terms of how small compared you know the dimension of the aortic arch compared to the dimension of the ductus arteriosus is less than half the size this is another case of hypoplastic left heart syndrome here you see this single right ventricle right atrium here this is the left atrium again this is posterior anterior left and right and so we're seeing the atrial septum here bowing from left to right which is an abnormal uh, finding in this fetus and then when you look at the pulmonary veins with color doppler you can see here on this left pulmonary vein to and fro flow both colors red and blue and so this is indicating that the atrial septum may be restrictive to some extent and so when we pulse doppler that pulmonary vein we can see that the forward to reverse ratio is highly abnormal with significant atrial uh, reversal during atrial pulsations during atrial kick we have this forward to reverse ratio of 1.6 severe is less than three and um, this is well within the severe range so we've talked about the most extreme left heart outlet obstruction with hypoplastic left heart syndrome and this is another severe type of obstructive lesion on the left side of the heart this is critical aortic valve stenosis and this is the picture that we see in the most extreme form where we have a severely dilated and poorly functioning left ventricle with endocardial fibroelastosis this brightening of the endocardium here and papillary muscle and a poorly opening mitral valve due to really high filling pressures here and so when we look with spectral doppler of this mitral inflow we see a monophasic low velocity inflow wave that is very short in its duration and some regurgitation of the mitral valve which we haven't been able to get a good uh, tracing of but that's another important component of this just to get an idea of what the left ventricular uh, systolic pressure is and when you look at this restrictive inflow pattern against normal you can just see how striking this is with this low velocity monophasic inflow pattern here against this uh, biphasic normal looking flow pattern you can see just how how dramatic the flow through this obstructed uh, left side of the heart is we will then turn our attention to the atrial shunting with color doppler here is the left atrium the right atrium and you can see this jet of left to right flow through this atrial septum which is abnormal and when we turn on spectral doppler and interrogate that region we can see all left to right shunting continuous high velocity left to right shunting through that atrial septum primum we then look at the pulmonary veins in the same fashion that we would with that last case of hypoplastic left heart syndrome we always look at the atrial uh, the pulmonary veins coming into the left atrium and we can see here typical 
a restrictive pattern with systolic and diastolic and not very much in the way of atrial reversal, but this is still an abnormal uh, finding in these cases and typical for this particular type of left heart obstruction. Looking at the aortic outflow here, we can see in this four chamber view through the left ventricular outflow tract, we see turbulent antegrade flow through this aortic valve. You can see aliasing here in the aortic root. And then when we interrogate with spectral Doppler, we can see spectral broadening and velocity is slightly elevated here, uh, simply due to the fact that the left ventricular contractility is poor and the left ventricle is not able to generate enough force to create a higher gradient through that severely stenotic valve. And in comparison to the normal case here on the right side, you can see spectral broadening in the AS case and a short ejection time here. So again, we also look at the arches. And so it's similar to what we see in hypoplastic left heart syndrome. This is the ductal arch here on the left side. And we can see all anti-grade flow here is the spine. And so we're imaging from the back of the baby nice brisk anagrave flow through that ductus arteriosus. And then on the right side here, you can see when we turn to the aortic arch, we sweep over toward the aortic arch, it's all retrograde systolic flow. And so we would follow that up with flow through the uh, spectral Doppler evaluation of that flow through the ductus arteriosus, making sure that that looks like a typical normal pattern. And then systolic flow reversal of flow in the aortic arch is typical in these cases and here you can see that systolic reversal of flow in the aortic arch. So we've looked at critical left heart obstructive lesions and now we're going to look at right heart obstructive lesions. This is pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum and you can see this severely hypertrophied and poorly contracting right ventricle where the Apex of the right ventricle doesn't quite meet the apex of the left ventricle, so uh, slightly hypoplastic as well. And you can see with 2D that there's some TR here with this poorly moving tricuspid valve. And we look with color Doppler, we can see severe tricuspid valve regurgitation. And so we're going to interrogate that. And we see a severely elevated right ventricular systolic pressures with this TR gradient of above four meters per second. And so this indicates to us that there's a severe outlet obstruction to this right ventricle. And then we'll sweep up to the RV outflow tract here. This from the four chamber view, we can sweep cephalad from that same view previous and we can see the pulmonary valve here. And you can see it well formed. It is moving, but there is no full excursion of the valve. You can see the main pulmonary artery is nicely uh, developed and when you compare it to the aortic uh, ascending aorta, it looks like it's proportional in size. So you place color Doppler on, you can see that there is no flow through this pulmonary valve. Here you have systolic reversal of flow in that pulmonary root there with swirling. And that's all because there is a ductus arteriosus that is perfusing the pulmonary arteries retrograde. This three vessel tracheal view here, you can see the trachea. This is SVC aorta here, and there's the ductal connection here with the ductus arteriosus. And with color Doppler, you can see the same thing this retrograde red jet of flow into that pulmonary root uh, and swirling around here. And so this is pulmonary atresia with retrograde ductal flow perfusing the pulmonary arterial uh, circulation. Here is that uh, tracing the pulse wave. Doppler tracing of that systolic reversal into the main pulmonary artery from that ductus arteriosus. So these cases of right heart obstruction can also have some degree of atrial septal shunt restriction. And so this, in this case, this is a sagittal view. You can see the spine back here. There's the aortic arch and you see the ductus here in the picture, but we're focusing on this foraminal flap here. And so this is where the IVC comes in. This is the eustachian valve, right atrium here. This is left atrium and it should be bowing appropriately into that left atrium. And there is a laminar right to left shunt through that atrial septum uh, opening in the atrial septum, the flap of the foramen of alley. When you look with color Doppler at the hepatic venous flow in the IVC, 
and the ductus venosus here, you can see some pulsation, some reversals with just a flash of red in this particular case where we're scanning from the front of the fetus here. Looking with pulse Doppler, you can see these atrial reversals in this hepatic vein, which, which are abnormal, uh, but not so for this case. We typically will see some degree of atrial reversal on both the hepatic veins and the ductus venosus, and this is because the entire systemic venous return, cardiac output through the right heart, is being diverted across this foramen of alley. So because of the right heart outlet obstruction, right heart filling pressures are severely elevated, and so everything that's coming into that right atrium needs to shunt across that foraminal opening. And so since that foraminal opening is sort of semi-fixed and it's of a certain size that will only handle a certain amount of flow on a normal situation, we have everything coming in going across that, and this is sort of a relative restriction. And looking at the umbilical vein in the liver here, we can see just how significant those atrial uh, reversals are, where we have pulsations, atrial pulsations on the UV tracing here. In the most extreme of obstructive lesions, we will have what we see here. This is high drops. This is a four chamber view. This is the back of the fetus here. And we're seeing some significant pleural effusion and pericardial effusion in this case. And so this is a case where we have severe inlet obstruction through these atrioventricular valves. And so we have mitral valve stenosis and tricuspid valve stenosis, significant inflow acceleration through both of those valves, shown here with this spectral broadening of this mitral inflow, severely elevated um, velocities here with a short uh, filling time. The same thing with the tricuspid valve. We have this really short filling time, severely elevated flow velocities through both of those valves with spectral broadening. And then when we look at the pulmonary venous tracing, we can see a similar picture to what we saw with the left heart obstructive lesions, where we have significant A wave reversal and blunting of the, the diastolic component of that pulmonary venous flow pattern. Moving to a short axis view through these atrioventricular valves, you can see here this left ventricle with the mitral valve here, closely spaced papillary muscles, very thick, dense mitral valve apparatus that's not opening very well. Same thing on the right side, you can see some sense of what the tricuspid valve anatomy is as well. And so when we look at the DV and umbilical venous tracing here with color Doppler, we can see systolic pulsations. And when we evaluate with spectral Doppler, the typical flow patterns that we see with atrial reversals in that ductus venosus and also in the hepatic vein tracing here, we can see systolic and significant reversal, atrial reversal here as shown. And sampling all the way back to the umbilical cord, you can see this umbilical venous tracing where you have atrial pulsations and reversals on this um, cord tracing. And so this is a severe finding in this fetus. Tricuspid valve atresia is another form of extreme right heart obstructive lesion where we have an atretic tricuspid valve here and all of the flow has to go across this foraminal opening. And so in the short axis view, you can see clearly that the dominant left ventricle, mitral valve, papillary muscles, everything on the left side of the heart looks normal. And then the right ventricle is very small and there's not a tricuspid valve inlet to that chamber. And so when we look at the foraminal flap bowing into the left atrium, we can see a normal looking opening here. But when we check with color Doppler again, we have this slight acceleration of flow through that foraminal open opening and then it's because everything coming back to that right atrium has to pass through that foraminal opening and so we're going to have these reversals on the hepatic venous tracings as shown here atrial reversal here is systolic anti-grade flow the diastolic component is slightly blunted and we have significant atrial pulsations back into the hepatic venous and same thing with the dv we're seeing these little pulsations back. You can uh, faintly see little flashes of red. 
um, specifically in the hepatic veins here, but the ductus venosus is affected as well. And you can see these atrial pulsations. This is not significant. This is a typical finding that we see in these right heart obstructive lesions. And as long as there's not high drops, we should still evaluate these flow patterns and show them but we, we would follow this fetus and look for any signs of high drops developing. And then all the way back to the umbilical vein, we can see these atrial pulsations on that tracing. Total anomalous pulmonary venous connection with obstruction is considered a, an extreme obstructive lesion. And here we have the pulmonary venous confluence with pulmonary venous flow return from this right lung coming back to the confluence here uh, and the pulmonary veins come and they do not connect to the atrium in this case. And so what we'll do is we'll make sure that this is aligned in a way that we can use pulse Doppler to evaluate the flow pattern. And when you see a flow pattern in the pulmonary venous confluence that looks like this continuous sort of undulating non-phasic flow as you would normally see in a normal tracing here with the phasicity of systolic, diastolic, and an atrial component, you just have this continuous flow, you should be suspecting some level of obstruction downstream. And so here we are down in the four chamber view, and we can see the ventricles here. You got the left ventricle here on the left, right ventricle. You see this large complete AV septal defect. This is a type of heterotaxy syndrome. This is right atrial isomerism, and you can faintly see the pulmonary venous confluence back here. But when you turn the color on, you can clearly see with low scale Nyquist uh, color interrogation, because we can't pick up this flow unless we turn the color scale down into the teens, just to pick up this continuous flow into this pulmonary venous confluence from these right veins here, the left veins in the red, and they don't quite meet the heart. And so when you sweep up into the three vessel tracheal view and this fetus has a right sided aortic arch, there's the trachea here. You're seeing this flow and it's sort of a blue flow from this area, some turbulent flow here, again, pulsatile flow in the aorta, but you're seeing this continuous turbulent flow. This is the right SVC over here. This is a left SVC, and you're seeing some turbulent flow from that region down flowing toward this vessel. And so when we interrogate that flow, we're seeing this pattern right in this area here. So this is not where the obstructive component of this uh, total anomalous drainage to this vertical vein is. This is the same pattern we were seeing in the, in the pulmonary venous confluence. And so we need to go looking for that obstructive component of the vertical vein, the egress. And so in this case, we've gone to this sagittal view in the fetus where we're showing the aortic arch and a long axis. And you can see that obstructive vertical vein right near where the bronchi are. And so it's nicely lined up with the plane of incination. And we're going to uh, evaluate that with continuous wave Doppler. And we can see a continuous flow pattern here with a mean gradient of nearly eight millimeters of mercury, very high for this fetus, and presents a challenge postnatally to manage this fetus. And so next we'll talk about cardiac output in the fetus. And as you probably know, 60 to 65% of cardiac output comes from the right heart, the remainder comes from the left heart, and the combined amount, which is what we have indexed here, uh, is around 425 milliliters per minute per kilogram. And that's plus or minus 200 milliliters just in general because the normal cardiac ratio, cardiac output ratio is between 1.2 and 1.5. And that can change. Uh, early gestation has a smaller ratio. And then as we get further along, we can see uh, more cardiac output going through the right heart. Tracking cardiac output can be very important in certain fetuses. And so when you see in this case, we have absent ductus venosus in this fetus, and this is a sort of a sagittal view through the pelvic region of the fetus where the umbilical uh, vasculature joins the umbilicus here. The umbilical vein is this large venous structure that goes down into the pelvis and then connects to the IVC. 
And as we track that superiorly, we can see it connects to the azagous system, it bypasses this baby, has an interrupted IVC, and so we see it bypasses that floor of the right atrium and connects to the SVC here via the typical normal uh, structure of the azagous veins, very enlarged, and you can see just how much flow is going through this structure and how large that structure is. When we look at the heart, we can see that the CT ratio, the, the cardiac area to, you know, the thoracic area is very, very large, uh, with the ratio being in the 0.4 to 0.5 range. And you can see this azagous vein connecting to that right atrium here. Big right heart structures, also big left heart structures. We have a lot of this flow going, streaming across into the left heart. And so, again, we want to apply those principles of lining up the outflow tracks to make sure that we evaluate these outflows appropriately. And we can see in both of these tracings that the VTIs are very uh, elevated. The, the amount of flow going through both sides of the heart, specifically the right heart, uh, are elevated. And so the normal cardiac output has been surpassed tremendously. And so what we're seeing is a combined cardiac output of 1340 milliliters per minute in this heart. And that makes the index much higher than normal. Remember, we talked about normal being right around 425, maybe 600, 650 at the most. And in this case, we've nearly doubled the normal amount. So in this case, we need to follow this fetus quite closely and make sure that we don't see any development of high drops. Twin twin transfusion syndrome can be a high output lesion as well. And so we're gonna use certain methods to evaluate uh, the cardiac output and specifically the, the cardiac function in both fetuses. And this is just an example of how the fetuses would look. Here you have polyhydramnius in this recipient fetus over here on the left side and fetus A is the donor and you can see this membrane draped over the fetus. This is oligohydramnius in this fetus and poly on this side and so we have this poly oli appearance. And so when we start out evaluating these hearts what we want to do is we want to align the outflow tract and inflow and specifically in this case we have the mitral inflow and aortic outflow here and we'll widen our gate our sample of the you know sample volume will widen the gate of the sample and we'll evaluate both inflow and outflow in the same tracing and so what that gives us is this unique tracing where we can see the mitral inflow and the aortic outflow but importantly we have these clicks from the valves and this gives us perfect measuring points when we measure the tay index it will allow us to properly measure the timing of events so that we can get a, an accurate um, T index. And the normal range is between 0.33 and 0.49. Again, there are uh, graphs that match with the gestational age and that changes. The numbers can be in the high range in the late third trimester and that's normal. Now it can be a challenge to try to align the right heart and a normal heart, uh, how the topology of the right heart is quite different than the left where you can not always get the inflow and outflow portions in the same picture. And in this case, we've gone to this sort of sagittal short axis view through this right heart and we're seeing inflow and outflow. Here's the aortic valve in cross section. And so this allows us to align the sample volume where we need to, to get in the same region, the same picture, these tracings that are shown here. And so what we have is the tricuspid valve on one side and the pulmonary outflow on the other. And again, we're trying to get these clicks from tricuspid closure to tricuspid opening and the pulmonary ejection time so that we can more accurately evaluate the Tay index in the right heart. And the ranges would be the same as we see them on the left heart. And so the, 
Te indices should be in the same range for both sides of the heart. And so here's the example. So again, we have that same fetal uh, pair that we saw earlier, and this is the recipient's heart. And what we're going to do is we're aligning this four chamber view so that we can better evaluate the evaluate the Tay indices in both the right and left hearts. So this is the left heart Tay index here, and we're measuring from mitral closure to opening here and the aortic ejection time. And then we're here, we're measuring the heart rate in the same tracing, and we'll calculate that. And then on the right side of the heart, we do the same thing for the tricuspid opening here and the pulmonary outflow. Tay index here, it's the same way. And we can see that the Tay index for both sides of the heart are markedly elevated in this case. So how about regurgitant lesions? Uh, this is very recognizable. This is Epstein's anomaly. Here we have a four chamber view and you clearly see severe right atrial enlargement, atrialized RV here with this displaced tricuspid valve down at the apex. And so with Epstein's anomaly or in this case, a dysplastic tricuspid valve with significant regurgitation, we are going to evaluate specifically with color Doppler when we suspect that there is some uh, level of regurgitation within the heart, whether it be the atrioventricular valves or the semilunar valves. In this case, we have severe tricuspid regurgitation. And so our first step is to evaluate what that velocity is with continuous wave Doppler. And we've lined it up nicely with the plane of incination, and we're looking at a high gradient of tricuspid valve regurgitation, which is not a normal regurgitant uh, velocity. We then want to turn our attention to the RV outflow tract and see what's happening with flow going antegrade through the pulmonary valve. Is there flow? In a lot of these cases, we don't see antegrade flow. This is kind of a three vessel, kind of a short axis view here at the end where you have the right atrium, aorta, and then this pulmonary artery, which we can see is somewhat hypoplastic with the, the right pulmonary artery here and the left pulmonary artery here. And when we turn color Doppler on, we can see that it is not anti-grade flow. It is all retrograde flow uh, provided from the ductus back here. And there's even a component of pulmonary valve regurgitation. And so this is what we would call a circular shunt. And here's the pulmonary regurgitation. You have systolic and diastolic components of continuous flow through this retrograde through this pulmonary artery into the right ventricle, which we can see here with this arch view. This is the back of the fetus. We have this the spine here, and this is aorta, a long axis of the aorta flowing anagrade, and then all retrograde flow in the ductus, which translates back to the main pulmonary artery and regurgitates into the right ventricle again. And we're interrogating this ductus, and we can see a continuous diastolic, systolic, and diastolic flow pattern through that ductus arteriosus. And so I mentioned a circular shunt. Well, this is a sort of a diagram depicting that. We see this continuous flow retrograde through the ductus arteriosus here. Because of the regurgitation through the tricuspid valve, this flow goes back into the right atrium and goes across the foramen of valley with the flow coming in from the ductus venosus. This extra volume of flow goes through that left heart and goes out the aorta, anagrade, and then gets recirculated back through the ductus back with regurgitation through the pulmonary artery. Since there's no anagrade flow through the pulmonary artery, it comes back into the right ventricle again and gets regurgitated back. And this, this is the circular shunt here. And it can cause some uh, malperfusion in the, in the cerebrum as well. We have some, sometimes we have uh, abnormal cerebral flow and we'll have uh, a sort of a low resistance because of brain sparing activity. And so we need to evaluate that as well. So in that case, you need to know how to evaluate the middle cerebral artery in the fetus. And so in this case, we have, we're seeing the falks here, the fetal head is on its side, and you can see that the middle cerebral artery is lined up nicely, almost parallel with the plane of incination. And this is important for getting a nice, uh, accurate signal when you use pulse wave Doppler. And so that pulse wave tracing should look like this, nice, normal systolic upstroke,
not more than 50 centimeters per second as a normal uh, middle cerebral artery, artery tracing. Later in gestation, we may see a higher velocity, but this normal transition down to the diastolic component of the waveform, not going to the baseline, not below the baseline, uh, and this is a normal looking tracing here. In contrast to that normal tracing, we have a vein of Galen. This is pretty obvious. I've, I've placed this here just because you can see how significant this waveform uh, is different from the normal waveform where we have an elevated systolic and diastolic component and very high diastolic uh, pulsatility index in this tracing. And this would be a fetus that has anemia. It's mildly abnormal. Uh, you can see here that there is a higher velocity. Again, systolic velocities are well above the normal range with the diastolic component being much higher than it should be as well. And so in summary, you want to make sure that you follow the standardized fetal cardiovascular flow assessment, and that includes evaluating all flows through the heart and outside of the heart as well. We want to align and interrogate flows parallel to the image plane as possible. This is very important for uh, accurate information. Also recognize normal flow patterns to identify the abnormal patterns. You want to know what normal looks like so that when you're looking at something, you can tell whether it's abnormal just at a glance. Make sure that you change the scale of the color Doppler to investigate those low velocity flows. And specifically, if you're not seeing flows in a structure like the pulmonary veins, you want to lower the scale until you can see that. Minimize pulse wave Doppler. This is what we call ALARA. You want to make sure that you're not using the pulse wave Doppler too much uh, in a specific time. The dwell time that we talk about with the Doppler being on for a prolonged period of time is not good for the fetus. And also on that same note, you want to make sure that you optimize the thermal index in tissue and bone. This is typically set in the machine, but if you can uh, change the settings to be below 1.0, that's best for the fetus. Once again, thank you for viewing the presentation.